first, welcome, Dr. Wu. I'm, we're just very honored to have you with us for this interview series. Um, I, I really wanted you to do most of the talking, but I'd like to let people know if there's anyone who by chance doesn't know who you are, I'd like to just say a few words uh, uh, by way of introduction and then ask you a few questions. First thing I wanna say is how honored we are, uh, especially since you have served as both the director and the administrative director of the Ricci Institute at University of San Francisco. And what's very interesting about you, Dr. Wu, is that you have not only produced a scholarship of your own, but you have helped a lot of other people produce extremely important scholarship. So you were in a unique place of not only being a scholar, but being a scholar who helps other scholars. And that to us, I think is very significant. Um, You've published quite a lot, and there's too much to mention, but there are three things that really um, have, have, have been at my elbow as I've worked on uh, research. Uh, obviously, the first one is your Encounters in Dialogue, uh, which is an edited volume, an international symposium. I love this title. It's very um, descriptive, an international symposium on cross-cultural exchanges between China and the West from the late Ming to the early Qing. You also published uh, an edited volume, Christianity in China, a Scholar's Guide, to resources in libraries and archives in the United States. I use that almost every week. And then finally, the book that I actually personally have loved the most that you were instrumental in producing was uh, the book, um, I think you translate it in English as Narratives from the Hinterlands. Um, I love the English translation, but the Chinese tells you a lot more. So in any case, uh, uh, we're just honored uh, and, and grateful for your willingness to, to be a part of this series. But let me just stop now because we're gonna let you do all the talking and I'll begin with the first question. And that is, uh, Dr. Wu, what brought you to the field of, of uh, China Christianity studies and, and why are you interested perhaps in the particular areas that you have selected to focus on? Oh, thank you so much, um, Professor Clark. And it is really, the honor is really mine um, you know, to be part of your project and to spend some time with a fellow scholar and distinguished fellow scholar like you to reflect what has been going on and what has been affecting us both academically and personally. And then more importantly, looking ahead and what we can do individually, jointly, in what areas. So it, um, um, as, uh, I have been looking forward to it. I, I know that this is going to be a rewarding experience. Well, um, the, I did not choose this particular research subject by myself. And uh, from the beginning, I was born in China and uh, uh, I often say that I was born under the red flag and brought up under the red flag. And it was not until the late, uh, early 1980s I, I joined the, basically the first wave of mainland Chinese scholars to further my studies in the United States. And uh, I didn't have any money. I remember the first time I came, I had $50 in my pocket. And all I wanted to do is to get a master's degree in education. And I want to be a teacher. And uh, with that, I thought I would be able to return to China and then teach. And that's everything that I had at that time, of course. And when people... Uh, are in their 20s and uh, they had a lot of dreams and they, they're still trying to decide. But it was not until 1986 and I had the opportunity to meet a remarkable man who really changed my life later on. And his name is Edward J. Malatesta. And he was a Jesuit and uh, born in the United States as an Italian immigrant and ordained and in the, I believe in the 50s, and he really wanted to commit himself to uh, Jesuit China mission, but was not able to. And later on, and he studied, uh, I think he did his uh, uh, doctoral degree in theology and with a dissertation on St. John's and spent a lot of time in Rome teaching the Bible, basically the script, scriptures and so on and so forth. But it was not until the late 19th, 70s, 
when the di diplomatic relationship between China and the United States uh, was normalized and the opportunity came. And then he started uh, you know, transferring himself from more of a Bible teaching professor to a real China committed uh, missionary, if I may. But at the same time, you know, he's a scholar. He studied Chinese and uh, for a year and a half, and he was so good. And he later on uh, in his life, he was able to teach in Mandarin in China. And uh, in 1986, a Catholic sister, uh, Dominican sister said, uh, Thanksgiving is coming. I'm going to invite you to our Thanksgiving dinner, but I'm going to introduce you to a person who had been bitten by China bug. And uh, so I was sitting next to him. And, uh, you know, that was the first time I got to know Father, uh, Father Malatesta. And it was the first time I actually I had an intimate friendship with a priest. And um, so at the dinner, everything he could talk about was China, nothing else. And so I was so impressed and so touched. And in the middle of a celebration of Thanksgiving, and I was blessed with this opportunity to know somebody who is a foreigner, but who is so committed and so much wanting to uh, give himself to China. And it really touched me. And of course, later on, I was, uh, 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 admitted to a doctoral program in, in education. And at that time, and Father Malatesta, uh, Father Malatesta was very much encouraging and in supportive to, uh, to help me to get into the field to study the educational history of China relating higher educational history in China, in modern China relating to missions. And so I spend a lot of time studying the early history of the Fuzhen University and from the late 1920s to early 1930s. And with the help of Father Malatesta, later on, he con uh, uh, connected me with many other people. That got me started. And that just opened up a very, very broad field of research, scholarship, and uh, but you know, among everything that I have um, uh, experienced, I would say that um, everything started from, the, from Malatesta and along the way, and he was walking with me, not only in terms of specific, you know, a research subject or a specific historical era or any particular person, but it is the human relations that he, uh, you know, he shared with me, the friendship that he shared me that has really inspired me to uh, get into this field, get to know, and what has happened in history, uh, and, um, and more importantly, above and beyond, is what is still going on that is affecting us. Mm -hmm. So if there's one person and one moment that has changed my entire life, I would say it, would, uh, it, it was Father Edward Malatesta and it was that Thanksgiving dinner that made the change when I look back. Now that's a really marvelous story. You, know, you mentioned too the, the contours of your research. I wonder if you can remember any specific moment or research discovery or anything in your, in your life studying this topic that made you think differently about it. Uh, I think it is a kind of gradual process, and I didn't, uh, you know, recognize anything, you know, right from the beginning or anticipated anything right from the beginning. And, uh, but, and again, it goes back to Father Malatesta. And when I was a fresh, young doctoral student, and of course, when you were, when you were a doctoral student, you're kind of fearless. You don't know what you're getting into and everything would be rosy and everything I want to do and I'll be able to do it and so on and so forth. So, and one day, and Father Malatesta said, hey, hey look, Shen, here's a project that you may want to look into and if you're interested, I would like you to continue. And he brought me a thick book of about 600 something pages and it is the uh, Christianity in China Scholar's Guide to the Resources, resources 
in the libraries and archives in the United States. First edition and edited mainly by Dr. Archie Crouch, who was a missionary to, uh, in Sichuan province in the 1940s. And, um, and I was just so fascinated by the, uh, the amount of information uh, about missionaries to China and where they are in the United States, in what kind of format, and the categories and the so on, the historical events and um, photos and uh, movie clips, anything you mention it, it was just so fascinating. It was like a little child in a toy store. And, you know, anything you pick up, it turns out to be gold. And of course, at that time, uh, Dr. Ajit Crouch was already in his mid-70s. And he, I had uh, the great fortune to meet him many times. And he coached me how to uh, update his first edition and all of that. And um, but I had no idea how complex, how difficult, how challenging the whole project uh, would be. So I had a, you know, a grand idea. Okay, now I'm a first year doctoral student. I can finish that by the end of my studies. And then with a dissertation, with a newly published book, I, you know, uh, oh, oh, I'm set. Uh, and of course, who would have known it would have taken me 10 years to finish that. And it's so comprehensive, but it's so enjoyable. And not only because that it was picking up uh, some, uh, something that a former missionary had left uh, without being able to finish and kind of a continuing mission, but also the academic um, you know, uh, information that it contains that I, I thought I would be able to enhance, improve, and then bring it again with modern technology to more scholars. But I was able to get in touch with more than, oh, easily 350 um, you know, archivists, curators, librarians throughout the United States and establishing personal relations with them. That's very, very enriching uh, to me and uh, both professionally and personally. So if there's one event, I think, I mean, there are so many events that would be interesting, but when you ask the question, and this is the very first thing that kind of struck me. And also it shows the naivety of a doctoral student. Uh, um, but I, I'm, I'm glad it's done. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the first time I've heard that project took you 10 years, which is, which is that, that you had perseverance to do that is quite impressive. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think most of the, the work you did on that project, you did here in, in North America. Sure. But, you know, in, in the many years I've known you, you spent a lot of time in China. And I wonder if you might reflect upon a meaningful moment that you've experienced while doing your work uh, in China. Uh, yes, and um, actually, and again, there are so many moments, instead of one, could I, could I give two? And, um, and, you know, sort of a two with the price of one, so to speak. And um, there are two particular moments that uh, in my uh, professional you know, career and personal relations uh, that I think when you asked the question that came in my, into my mind immediately. The first one took place in 1990, I would say 1996. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was in Taiwan and attending an international association of Ricci Institutes that would include members of the Ricci Institute from Taipei, from San Francisco, from uh, Paris at that time, and also a few other Jesuit related, uh, you know, uh, Je Jesuit uh, administered China operations, so to speak. And it was at that moment that um, uh, that it was at that, that meeting that, uh, and again, Father Malatesta was still with us. And when he was doing his presentation to report to everybody what you know, had been going on at the REACH Institute, at the end of it, he said, you know, time has changed. China has, is moving on with the economic reforms, the open doors and everything else with all of us. Uh, have been, you know, all of us who have been committing ourselves so much to this particular field. But at the same time, we have to recognize we are in our 60s. 
and mid 60s, 70s, and look at you. And how many of you still have dark hair? And I think I was one of the few who still had dark hair. And he said that looking at the work of the REACH Institute, I think this is the moment for us to consider to have a new director who is from mainland China, who knows about China, who's committed to China, who's willing to work with us. And I am in this process to contemplate uh, you know, what the future of the REACH Institute would be. I don't have any answers yet, but I'm thinking. So that was a striking moment to me that as a foreigner, and he could look at future, look at the, you know, not only the relationship between Jesuits and, uh, you know, Chinese, but also looking at the future development of China uh, as its role in the world and also in and of itself. And he thinks that, you know, it has to be, whether it is a study of Christianity in China or whether it is a Jesuit mission to China, it has to be a Chinese driven. And it cannot be a simply a foreigner's act, so to speak. It really struck me and at that uh, moment, and of course, and we didn't talk much about it, you know, for quite a while. Um, so that was the first moment. The second moment, I was already the director of the REACH Institute uh, for about, I would say, 10 years, and it was 2009, so very much kind of fast moving forward. I was able to, and very fortunate, to conduct a uh, pro project in China. It is called Narratives from the Hinterland, with the support of financial uh, help uh, from the Henry Luce Foundation in, in New York City. And um, now, and then the subject itself was to help to identify and work with six universities beyond the major urban cities, uh, such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, Fuzhou, and all of that, but in remote areas and, and help the local scholars to develop their programs in the study of cross-cultural, you know, uh, encounters uh, with emphasis on Christianity, uh, the, the, you know, religion. So I was in Lanzhou, and it was the first time I was in Lanzhou, organized an event, and uh, we had a seminar. I was, I was very much uh, kind of uh, impressed and moved. Not only those, uh, you know, the participants were not only scholars in the study of Catholicism, Protestantism, but also Buddhism, Taoism, and uh, and Muslim and Islam. And so in the middle of the break of uh, my session, and uh, there were three young women, and I knew, and I was so ignorant at that time about Muslim, that they were they, these three young women all wearing beautiful, uh, you know, scarves. And they're in their probably very early uh, 20s. Later on, I learned that they were being trained as teachers to teach Kalan uh, and in their local communities. So, and uh, I wanted to go and greet them. And as soon as I turned my eyes to them and they look at me, they got very nervous. And that made me very nervous because I didn't know what I should do in front of Muslim women. And I'm sure they were equally kind of nervous about me who is, well, maybe a Ch Chinese, maybe American, maybe a combination of both. But I went to them uh, anyway, and then I look at them, they look at me for a few seconds, we didn't say anything. Later on, I said, you're nervous, right? And uh, they all of a sudden, they laughed and said, yes, you are too, right? And so that started our conversation. I couldn't remember what we were talking about, but I really remember that moment. And there is a basic connection that between among human beings, whether, you know, whatever religious affiliation you have. And at the same time, people have common interests. Uh, you know, for me, as a non-Christian, I'm interested, I'm interested in Catholicism, in the history of Christianity in China, but also strong interest in Protestantism and higher education and so on and so forth. And there, these were young women who were, uh, were interested in, you know, Muslim religion in China. And then there is a connection that inspired me further to look at, you know, besides, you know, individual uh, religion that is, you know, religions that were are recognized by the Chinese government, and other any other areas that can connect us, 
And so that kind of inspired me to, inter, uh, to look into kind of multidisciplinary areas and uh, areas other than history that may have affected the people in history and today, and such as you know, music, uh, sociology, uh, science, and art, and I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So that was a very inspiring moment too. So these are the two. Wow, you know, in, in all of these uh, really marvelous answers you're providing, you've mentioned uh, a kind of a repeated theme, and that is people that you've met. Uh, and I wonder if you might recall a specific memory regarding another scholar. I know you, you mentioned Father Ed Malatesta, um, but is there a, uh, an, another sort of memory that you have regarding another scholar or two uh, that, sh that you think should be remembered in the field of the study of Christianity in China? Uh, yes, of course. There are so many of them. And I think that, and again, I think as a scholar, I always enjoy scholarship, attending conferences and giving papers and doing projects and all of that, all of that, all of us are so familiar with. But above all of that, what I have been enjoying the most is to get to know lots of people. And people I have only you know, uh, I had only read their books and people have heard their names and, uh, and people I've never heard of and never even dreamed about a meeting and so on and so forth. And so throughout the years, I've got to know so many people. And so the friendship that I have, uh, you know, the fortune to establish with them is most rewarding. And again, I can think of two people really, and they are remarkable uh, people who have made a difference in my life. And I'm pretty sure that what they have done to me um, is not kind of, a, kind of a single isolated occasion. They must have done that to many people. The first person uh, is Daniel Bass, and who is in heaven now, and uh, who is a well-known giant in our field, the study of, the, uh, the study of history of Christianity in China. And, um, it was in 1990, and I was a doctoral student, and again, and I was, uh, I was invited to attend a workshop at Yale University and in New Haven. So uh, it was the first international occasion that I ever attended as a scholar, and I was certainly nervous, and it was certainly, um, there was a lot of anxiety and I didn't know anybody except one person from Hong Kong. And of course, and I was very intimidated in looking at those, you know, experienced scholars. And uh, as, a, as a Chinese, and you know, you don't approach to people to shake hands and introduce yourself. You just wait for others to introduce themselves to you. So, but in any event, and uh, the, the workshop was wonderful. And I learned a lot in terms of methodology, subjects, and, you know, all of that. And it was heavily focused on uh, the Protestant side of uh, Christianity in China. And uh, so lots of presentations. And it just so happened my presentation was the last one. And of course, in a two-day workshop, it was you know, heavily packed with you know, presentations and discussions. And everybody wanted to talk. Everybody ran over their time. So by the time when my presentation came, I think I only had a seven minutes left and for a, a you know, promised something like 30 minutes. So I just started doing all of these things as quickly as I, uh, I could. And then somebody kind of interrupted. I didn't know his name at that time. And he said, Xiaoxin, slow down. And nobody wants to push you, just do whatever you want. And later on, I got to know it was Daniel Bates. But in, it, in any event, so I, I slowed down, I was still nervous. By the 10th minute, I was already, you know, three minutes, it was already late. And then the chair of the panel said, Xiaoxin, I'm sorry, and you have to stop. And we're running out of time and so on and so forth. And it is this person again who came in and he said, well, you know, I'm sorry to, you know, to say that, you know, Xiaoxin's presentation was the, uh, was the last one, of course, but it was the only one on Catholicism. He's a young scholar. I think it's only fair for us to give him an opportunity to, to let him finish. It is important for him. It is important for everybody sitting here. It probably would be important for the future of this field. Let's hear what he's going to say. 
And later on, and after everything, you know, it was over, I went to him and introduced myself, you know, profusely. And, and then asked him, could I know, could I have your name? And he said, oh, uh, 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 Xiao Shen, my name is Daniel Bass. And uh, so it was a uh, remarkable and experience. And just to see those senior well-established scholars, how they could help others. So that was the first uh, the, the person. The second person, and, um, and I got to know him again, it was at a, a conference um, administered by the, um, what is that, USCCB, US China Catholic Bureau. And uh, at that time, it was called. It was in 19, early 1990s, and most of the people attending the conference were uh, from the church. There were a few scholars, including me, and Father Malatesta encouraged me to go. And then he said, you should meet this person who did a remarkable you know, research on the history of marital mission uh, to China. And the, re the research methodology is remarkable. And as a, young, as a PhD candidate, you should get to know him. But I was so intimidated. I mean, this is a senior scholar and I, I didn't know anything. And um, you know, would he have time to talk to me? Would he, give me? would he give me five minutes just to say, this is what I do. If you want to know more, here's a book and take a look at it. And eventually, uh, after a whole day session, everybody was tired. He spent about two hours and 30 minutes explaining entirely how he constructed his questionnaire, where the concept uh, of doing this came from, what would be the result, and how he generated the data, came to the conclusions, and how he had used those data in his book, uh, Marinol in China. And and that was um, Jean-Paul Wiest. And again, throughout the years, and I had very uh, deep you know, friendship uh, you know, uh, with him and with his family as well. And I appreciate the way that he helped uh, young scholars just in the way that Daniel Bass did uh, uh, two or three years before. And these are the, and that also inspires me to kind of a pass on the torch, if you may, and so to speak, and to help even younger generations and probably even younger scholars of several generations to pursue their you know, dreams and in the way that I was, uh, you know, I would be able to. And so that's um, probably as a too long uh, of an answer to a short question. <laughs> oh, that was really great to hear about these really monumental scholars and who really, I think, have influenced all of us. Um, well, we've, we've been talking for about 30 minutes. I think we have about 10 more minutes, but there's one question, and in my mind, it might even be one of the most difficult questions to think about, and that is, what, what are your hopes? What, what hopes do you have for the future of this field, um, for the field of the study of Christianity in China? Well, as a scholar, and now, you know, I think that I have more gray hair than dark hair now, and um, I do have a lot of hopes. <laughs> and um, there, are, um, um, there, there are hopes and regrets. And uh, regrets meaning the things that I wanted to do, but I you know, was not able to for one reason or another. And, um, and also uh, hopes that for the future, of course and not only for the field, but also for future generations of scholars. And I think these are interrelated. And I could think of a few. And to start with, um, I think that uh, when people look at this particular part of history, I hope that um, the entire field, uh, let's say in the narrower sense, the history of Christianity in China can inspire more people beyond the scholars specialized in this particular field. And uh, because uh, when we look at um, the encounters between China and West, not looking all the way back to the Nestorians and you know, all of that, we just look at 
uh, you know, from the late Ming, you know, Mattel Ricci's time and about 400 something years. And uh, uh, China has had a lot of encounters with the outside world, what, you know, uh, throughout its modern history. But the largest group of people who have had a steady, sustainable relationship with China, I think uh, I would say uh, are the missionaries. And at one point, I had a conversation with um, uh, another uh, well-respected, highly respected scholar, uh, Gary Tiedemann. And I asked, hey, Gary, and you've done so much research uh, in this particular field. And just how many Western missionaries uh, were in China, you know, from late Ming, early Qing to the, um, you know, early period of uh, People's Republic, you know, 1950s. How many? He made a rough number, including the, you know, the wives of the Protestant missionaries. And he kind of rolled his uh, eyes for, for just probably five seconds. He said, I, I will say easily 50,000. That is the largest number of people, you know, from the West to China different from diplomats who rotate themselves every three years and from one country to another, or different from merchants who come to a place to make money. If there's no money to be made, why the merchants are here? Or from tourists who go around and uh, take some snapshots, well, uh, took some you know, travelogue notes and uh, later on published them. These are the people, before even they set their foot in China, they committed themselves. Many of them decided I would go to China, I would not come back to the country that I was born. And uh, so, and of course, in spite of the fact that, you know, they, they hold their kind of a gospels in their hand and wanted to Christianize the country and so on and so forth, eventually many of them had been converted by China, or the Chinese people, and, uh, and much to their delight too, and they didn't regret. And so, but what they have left us, I think, are the largest amount of documents and archival sources and oral history and anything you name it in the study of cross-cultural relations between China and the West. And it's not religious. It is basically touching you know, every corner of our heart and mind. And so I hope there will be, if there's, um, you know, biggest hope is that our work today can inspire more people beyond our own field. And so that's one. The second one is that I hope that um, it is still the case, and um, unfortunately, that this particular field, if we look at uh, the, the entire field internationally, I think the voice is still, by and large, dominated by Western voices. And um, now it is, has improved significantly. And in the 1980s you know, or even 70s, for one reason or another, I mean, at, at that time China was closed and then there's nowhere for people to hear anything. And uh, you know, for the last 30 something years, lots of things have been produced by Chinese scholars and lots of the things have been brought to the attention to the Western world by Chinese scholars as well. But still, there is an imbalance. And uh, for one reason or another, I mean, political may be one, and the, the way of communication is another, cultural barriers may be another, but you know, for all of us who are in this field, I think we should still keep on doing uh, what we have been doing. In other words, to encourage the cross-cultural dialogues, uh, which should be balanced. And sometimes there may be mis, uh, you know, uh, misunderstandings and confusions, which is fine. I and mean, that's all the scholarship is for, you know. And um, uh, what is that um, thing that Mao Zedong said? Shi shi qiu shi. And uh, so we should, uh, you know, seek truth from the facts. And if we're based on the mutual understanding, equal relationship, and I think that, uh, you know, wherever we are, whether we're standing, you know, from this side of the Pacific or from the other side of the Pacific, we should encourage this equal-based dialogue. And hearing, have more patience, really, the other voices. 
And that would be important for us because no matter what we say, what we think would be right may not be, you know, even appropriate by the people that those missionaries have <laughs> devoted their lives to. So that's two. And three, and um, I, if we can, I think we should constantly uh, help the younger generations of scholars, not only from the West, but also from China and, uh, and other you know, countries in the world uh, in this field, not only financially, but also you know, uh, academically, including uh, possibilities of um, you know, international events. And we have to in intentionally encourage their participation and then help them. And um, in that regard, I think, uh, you know, and again, I'm not a Christian, but I have to say, and uh, we, we should do that with some kind of Christian uh, level dedication and uh, to move forward and to work with them and that kind of a persistence and commitment. Otherwise, it is just, um, you know, something temporary. Oh, you know, today we know you and now we shake hands and tomorrow, you know, I'm back in my country. And then, so who knows whether we're gonna see each other. And there are so many wonderful scholars. And in my experience, anywhere, you know, you go, whether it's in the United States, in Europe, uh, in China, and in other parts of Asia, and who are so talented, who have wealth of information, and we should help them in, you know, to broaden their views and to improve their research methodology and to encourage their dialogues and friendships with others. And then, um, last not the least, last not the least, um, I think that sometimes that we have done so much by ourselves and sometimes it's easy as scholars to get stuck in our own kind of a office or environment and so on and so forth and uh, but at the same time every day and as soon as i go out and to another country it doesn't have to be china and i would learn something and recently the, the REACH Institute has initiated a new project and uh, basically it is the, the study of the history of Christianity in East Asia. And it has broadened hugely my horizon and recognizing, you know, just right in front of my eyes with evidence that actually the history of Christianity in China is so much related to everywhere else. So we should, if you look at the kind of global history or, you know, a world church, whatever you name it, it is a world history that the Christianity in China only plays a, you know, a small part. And when we look at it, we should relate that field to the world history, to the history of other countries, to the cultures of other countries. And then we may be able to uh, be able to even use the old archives we have used so many times, we may be able to have new perspectives and new enlightenments. And that would be so important for us. And also so important for us, not only for us, but also for the field in the future. And we should let people know about it. So these are the, I can keep talking about it, you know, this and that, but these are the few things that I, you know, as you ask, I have thought about, and I think that I, I, I hope it would be helpful. Well, these were very nourishing and rich answers. And you, you mentioned both, you, you've, mentioned, uh, you've mentioned a lot of sort of anecdotes and recollections on scholars, but you also, in your this this answer, uh, mentioned uh, diplomats and uh, or or ambassadors. And Dr. Wu, I, I should say personally, we who are producing this series, we're grateful that you are taking the time to offer your your thoughts and your answers. But one of the things that I know I've heard a lot about you is how grateful people are that not only are you a scholar, but you you yourself are an ambassador of friendship, and and an ambassador of dialogue. And we are grateful not only for your work, which is certainly will be lasting for many, many generations, but also very much grateful for your spirit of, of friendship and, and dialogue between cultures. And um, for that, we're all grateful. But with that, we are out of time. 
So again, thank you so much, Dr. Wu. And uh, um, we all send you our very warm wishes for a, a wonderful summer. So thank you so much. Thank you. And it's really a pleasure to be with you and to share my experience. Thank you thank so you. much.